Sa Bolayo Morena Bolo Kase Chaba Sa Esu Ufe Di Se Din Dwale Matwenye Use Bolo Ke Use Bolo Ke Se Chaba Sa Esu Se Chaba Sa South Africa, South Africa, it blow from on say, it did defend on What was ever her test? Van Sounds the call to come together and united we shall stand. Let us live and strive for freedom in South Africa. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> I think Comrade Geraldine has already set the tone as to why we are here, who are we to celebrate, and whose life, rather, we are to celebrate. At a moment like this, Hugo, Hugo Victor Hugo, in memory of uh, Voltaire, he said, I open quotes, he died immortal. He departed laden with years, laden with wax, laden with most illustrious and most fearful of responsibilities, the responsibility of the human conscience, informed and rectified, close quotes. On that note, comrades, compatriots, let me use this opportunity to call upon the Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, who is, of course, 
our host today, this evening, Professor L. Mbedi. May we please give an applause as he <laughs> comes to this podium. Thank you, uh, Mr. Program Director, President uh, Tabo Mbeki and uh, Me uh, Zanele Mbeki, Professor Angina uh, Pahat and uh, the Pahat and the Parek families, uh, distinguished speakers, members of the ANC and Alliance partners, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am Litrokampedi, I'm Professor and Vice Chancellor of the great University of Johannesburg. I stand before you to pay tribute to a rich life, acknowledging the great debt that our country has to heroes of this caliber who have been instrumental in ensuring that the birth of a democratic South Africa was not just a dream. To Dr. Aziz Pahat's beloved family and colleagues and friends, we have come to celebrate an extraordinary man. To Professor Anjina Parek, uh, former Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic here at UJ, and the immediate family, we are with you as you traverse this journey of loss, but remembering that he has left an indelible mark in this world. We are also conscious of the loss that the Pahat family has had to bear in the last few uh, months. We deeply sympathize with the family as you gather again to honor a hero of our country. The late American poet Maya Angelou in When Great Trees Fall identifies the pain of loss but offers the hope of healing through her words. Open quote, our senses restores, restored never to be the same whispers to us. They existed, they existed. We can be, be and be better for they existed, close quote. Aziz Pahat was a statesman, a patriot, and an intellectual who embodied so much that is the best in South Africa. The former deputy foreign minister has received many accolades describing him as a luminary, a struggle hero, a man with a formidable intellect, knowledge of foreign policy and networks of diplomatic liaisons, as well as witty, Reconteur of note and fond of deeply intellectual debates and political critique. I'm sure that this memorial today will include accounts of his significant contributions. The struggle for liberation and the pursuit of democratic ideals was indelibly printed in his DNA and captures his life of dedication to the ANC, our country, and our continued quest for the great undoing of the ravages of apartheid. The depth and footprint of Aziz Pahat's life may not be patently visible to us, but any account of his life focuses on his monumental contributions to what has been described as, and I quote, progressive African-centered foreign doctrine, close quote. Speakers, academics, and writers will delve into his phenomenal contributions, both today and in the future as the histories of our country are written. It seems apt to draw on a Greek philosopher, a philosopher who stated, and I quote, if my history be judged useful by those who desire an exact knowledge of the past as an aid to understanding the future, which is the cause of human affairs must resemble, if it does not reflect it, it shall be content, close quote. A lesson to be derived from Professor, um, apologies, Dr. Aziz, Aziz, Aziz Pahad's life was that he probably did not see himself as featuring in the South African historical narratives. His focus was on navigating the road to freedom. This he did at great cost through his days and years in exile, while, uh, which must have come at a great personal cost to him and the family. I just returned from London for a week. The weather was so terrible, and I reflected on those that lived in London for years. And I say, I cannot complain for staying here for a week. People spend their lives there fighting for freedom, so I must just soldier on. And one of those people is um, Aziz Pahat. 
His early activist days and return to this country are documented in detail, celebrating his consistent achievements. At UJ, we are proud of our association with Mr. Pahat. I dare say the Pahat brothers were regular visit visitors here at UJ, and I personally met them from time to time. And although I was an insignificant man, but they always made me feel like I was the most important person at UJ. In February 2015, he discussed his book, Insurgent Diplomat, Civil Talks or Civil War, and said, and I quote, there are vital lessons that can be learned. Governments still resort to military aggression to resolve conflicts. Honesty, mutual understanding, and compromise are vital to bring an end to instability, close quote. There is clearly inherent value in his observation as we look at current global warfare and strife. In quintessential Aziz Pahad style, he engaged robustly with students and staff alike with reflections on his book at a talk hosted by the University uh, South African Research Chair in African Diplomacy and Governance in partnership with the university's library and the information sect, uh, uh, center. Uh, Professor Desai commented on the contributions of the book by validating its significance. And I, I quote, Prof. Desai said, insurgent diplomat is about the struggle of apartheid and the movement as a whole to eradicate South Africa uh, from its once oppressive state, not just an individual attempting to glorify their involvement in the struggle. No, the book is something greater than that, close quote. Ladies and gentlemen, his death is a great loss to our community, and we are greater for knowing him. And I would say he did his part, and what is left is for us to do our part. Thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the great University of Johannesburg. Thank you. Amanda, long live the spirit of Aziz Pahad. Long live. Viva NC, viva. viva. Thank you very much, Prof, for welcoming us. Now we are, we are good to go. Comrade Aziz belongs to a generation that uh, confronted tempting and testing moments with calmness, with intellectual prowess. On that note, comrades, allow me therefore to acknowledge the presence of the president of the Veterans League, Dr. Snuki Zigalala, I've seen him here, and also recognize, acknowledge the presence of the ministers in our government, Zuma, I've seen her here. Allow me to also acknowledge former speaker, Utatu Sisulu, uh, our former DG, Babu Chikani, and many, many, all of you, I'll say protocol observed, with Dr. Brigalia Bam, I've seen them. So all of you, you are a reflection of uh, what Comrade Aziz actually represent. So on that note, comrades, allow me to call one of the veterans, Uta to Comrade Walisi Rote, to come and make a tribute. Uh, I hope there can be a song there while he comes to the stage. Seguta Luzabalas. Seguta Luzabalas. Luzabalas. Comrade Bahati. Now Lalem Gotolo. Thank you very much. Babu Ali. Program Director, thank you very much. President Mbeki, Sizanele, SG of the African National Congress, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, allow please, allow me please, may I on behalf of the Veterans League dedicate this poem to Comrade Anjana, Comrade Meg, their children and grandchildren, and to the remaining Pahad brother, Nasim, and family, to the extended Pahad family, 
and of course to our beloved movement. Our hearts, minds, spirits are with the Palestinian people at this hour of their history as the Israeli apartheid state mercilessly spills their blood. Ah, Comrade Aziz, Comrade Hussein, Gulam, son of Bahat, Comrade Aziz, Bra Aziz, Aziz, where are you now? We ask, we must, because everywhere we go, we hear your name here. We see you, Aziz. We miss you because you are not here with us anymore. You being you, Aziz, ah, Aziz. We have, been in, we have been each other's keeper when you were here, son of Bahat. And Isop, you must not ufuna wena mean me, <laughs> for I will say now, now that at times we get angry at the Bahat ancestors, how we ask, how as if snatching they take one brother after another like that. And when you are the wind, when you no more can touch us anymore, how we ask them. We feel you and we see you, Aziz. We sense you but cannot touch you. You are the whistling wind now, flying across and above us. Ah, Aziz, we miss you and your struggle which we witnessed as you fought day by day when you sat under the shadow for the no quality of life in this, our nation. You, you straddled the world in body, thought and spirit, fighting. You, we feel you now, that fight and as endless as it was. And you, Isop, because we lived together and broke bread together, you the Pahats, with your tallnesses and presence, the Pahats and the quiet and silent Zunaid, because you, sons on, and fruit of the movement, which the earth span and span like a storm as it dipped its roots among the people, as it also clutched and made its grips tight, within and among the stories and journeys of the masses of our land, our people, and eventually on the continent. And the lion roared then. In Africa, my boo, yeah. My boo, yeah, in Africa. The lion roared for the strong will, wishes, and vision of the people to be the fruit of struggle every day every month, every year, every, every decade, born. They must be born, us. We do and must fly above and beyond oppression and exploitation of humans by you other humans. We must glide and gaze with a bird's eye view on this world. We have been nurtured by the streams, shades, ruggedy and rough rocks of the struggle for freedom. Your name and voice is still here among us, Aziz. Shadowless as you are now, Aziz. Aziz, what you have been and you have done here keeps peeping at us, reminding us we have to struggle on. Still, it whispers and whispers to us, Aziz. Don't instruct me to throw the bones as you used to instruct me in jest. I imagine you in yellows, mauve, reds, like the rising sun and the massive moon on the horizon to make day and to signal the night. I imagine you, Aziz, smiling, having defeated the body struggles you so fought against while here when you were making 
the transition through body, mind, and spirit while you're here, walking to where you are now, walking endlessly. We are signaling us to know that life is life and must be lived, for it does one day come to an end. You signaled us when it was so, so difficult. We were feeling as if we cannot breathe, still you held on and you held our hand through your eyes, through your silences, through the, the stories that you kept flesh flashing on your, on your face or through your glittering diamond-like jests. Ah, Aziz, fighting in life, you seemed to say, is constant up to the end. You hold on you, you hold on, you said, the same way you hold when the muscle pain, when you run from here to there, my brother and comrade, when it holds on also fighting you. You hold on until you hold hope in your hands and hand it over to your comrades and to others. Ah, Aziz, even now you glide and sail in spirit and in being. Ah, Aziz, ah, Gulam, say hi to Isop and to Fereida and to Zunaid and to the extended Bahad family who, have, who are with you. Say so till we meet again. Thank you. That is our poet laureate. That's comrade Mongane Wali Sorote, very close comrade and friend of comrade Aziz, comrade Esso. There's many stories to tell about them together, but that's for another time. Maybe a fireside chat or something of that sort. Thank you, thank you for that deeply felt poem. I'm now going to, uh, we'll now view a short video by Professor Willi Esterheiser. And uh, Professor Willi Esterheiser was a member a Stellenbosch professor and member of the Afrikaner Inner Circle. And there was an unlikely friendship that had actually grown between him and comrade Aziz, as well as President uh, uh, Tabumbeki, the fiery young revolutionaries, well, young in the 80s, when they were involved in the secret uh, discussions and negotiations. So let me hand over to Vili. 1980 and onwards, South Africa entered a people's war. The founding of the United Democratic Front in 1983 made things worse or the White Nationalist Party. President Boetas, in famous Rubicon speech, dashed all hopes and expectations of a negotiated settlement. A British company with mining assets in South Africa 
consolidated gold fields became concerned about their assets. The company decided to initiate and fund talks in Britain between members of the ANC and Afrikaners. I was one of the Afrikaners. The first meeting took place from November to 1st of November to the 3rd of November 1987. In the basement of the complete, complete Angler Hotel in Marlow, Buckinghamshire, next to the Thames River, uh, we talked in the basement of a hotel. Aziz greeted me in Afrikaans. Hello, Professor. Who found it in Oslan? Hello, Professor. How are things in our country? His word in our country sent out a strong message. Aziz became one of my best friends and a true compatriot and an expert in the art of listening to the other. He always made an effort to understand the position, grievances and dreams of the other. As this helped me in this regard. In fact, I got worried because I started to agree Pahat introduced me to an ANC guru, Tabum Beki. I remember him saying, if you want to understand the reasons of our struggle, talk to Tabu. We talked many times. My greatest political satisfaction is what I was asked when I was asked to set up the first meeting between the National Intelligence Agency of the ruling National Party and Mbeki and Zuma in Switzerland. From 1980 and onwards, South Africa entered a people's war. The founding of the United Democratic Front in 1983 Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, comrades. Um, I think you, you have heard the previous speakers speaking of comrade Aziz Bahad. I'm reminded of an African legend that whenever a prince is to be trained to take over, the elders will take him into the jungle so that he learns all the sounds of the jungle and he will always be returned to the jungle until he learns to hear the sounds that are not obvious to the ear. I hope the young people like ourselves are listening today. On that note, comrades, I would like to call upon Dr. Garth Lapierre, who has also been with Comrade Aziz in CAF, Consent African Forum. May we give a round of applause as he comes to the fore. Uh, a hearty good afternoon to all, uh, President Mbeki, Mrs. Mbeki, and let me echo um, the uh, ceremonial of all protocol observed. I'd like to thank Professor Angina Parek for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Angina. Um, I would like, you know, in the sort of rich cadences and rhythms of Aziza's life, perhaps single out an aspect uh, that is not well known or well understood, and that is his interaction with the research and academic community of this country uh, over the long 
uh, tenure as deputy foreign minister of this country. Actually, we once used to joke, you know, when I headed the Institute for Global Dialogue, that if there were Guinea's record for the longest serving deputy foreign minister, Aziz would win it hands down. Now, as the head of the Foundation for Global Dialogue, as it then was and subsequently became the Institute for Global Dialogue, I really count myself to be very fortunate, very fortunate to have been one of the main beneficiaries of Aziza's generosity of spirit, uh, his seriousness of purpose, as well as his great sense of humor. Because he really believed in the role that we as the FGD and the IGD uh, were mandated to play. And that was to really assist in imposing analytical order on and making normative sense, as it were, of the broad and challenging purview of this country's foreign policy objectives and its diplomatic uh, imperatives in a rather mercurial, uncertain, and a fast globalizing post-Cold War era. Now let us remember, you know, that South Africa's transition to democracy was almost coterminous uh, with the beginning of this uh, end of the bipolar era and the beginning of a rather different world. You know, there's a very nice acronym called VUCA world, V-U-C-A. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. So we have to sort of try and make sense of that. That is to say that based on his activist roots and intellectual pedigree, Aziz was a man, profoundly a man of ideas. Right? He understood and relished the importance of exchanging ideas, however contested those ideas were in the cauldron of debate. But in the crucible and interests of developing South Africa's social capital, as a country in trans transition on the one hand, and as a very integral part of its Republican ideal on the other. So in essence, and as a member of the research and academic community, Aziz played a central role in shaping our epistemic community when it came to identifying key agenda items and topical areas for research, analysis, and discussion in this country's growing menu of foreign policy and diplomatic challenges. So, with Deputy President Mbeki and later President Mbeki creating a very enabling environment, in this role, uh, Deputy Minister Aziz, he was open, was accessible, was participatory, and was very empowering, which I suspect carried over to his political principles, Ministers Nzo and Dlamini Zuma. So, let me cite a few examples, if I may if I may, uh, about this interface. The one is when South Africa hosted the 12th summit of the Nanalai movement in September 1988, and Aziz asked us as the institute to host a two-day workshop to better understand the NAM and its traditions. As a, as a matter of fact, with his help, I spent a very interesting and productive week uh, in New Delhi at the Institute of Nanoline Studies to understand the history and philosophy of the Nanoline movement. So Aziz opened that workshop with all the senior DFA officials in attendance and what an interesting workshop it turned out to be. However, one of the most challenging and rewarding research endeavors uh, that I must mention is that we undertook, and this was at his initiative and with his encouragement and support in 2005 and 2006. And this was a study of the history, study of the history and the future of Palestine and Israel and you know, the multiple questions that surround that, where the tragic and brutal consequences of illegal occupation now play themselves out in a very tendentious and partisan manner in the Western media. The outcome of that initiative was a three-day international conference of experts 
and a 400-page edited book titled The Future of Palestine-Israel from Colonial Roots to Post-Colonial Realities. And get this, Aziz read that book from cover to cover in appreciation of the pioneering nature of that project. So, even after he left government, Aziz's weather-beaten wisdom and his reflective analytical temperament were not lost to the country. Importantly, he worked on his exile memoir where the groundwork was completed. Three minutes. The groundwork was completed when, while he was a senior fellow at the Institute for Global Dialogue and with Angina. And over a period of several months, I enjoyed an editorial and substantive role in shaping the structure and content of his memoir. And the final product, as we all know, uh, is the book published in 2014, Insurgent Diplomat from uh, Civil Talks of, or, or Civil War, which really represents, uh, dear audience, the first and most intriguing public record of the secret talks in the United Kingdom and Switzerland among polit political protagonists in the ANC and representatives of the apartheid regime. It's a pity we didn't hear the conclusion of uh, what Professor Esther has, it, has to say because he was right at that coal face. Now, sadly, sadly, what all this suggests and what I'm trying to say to you is that the great and exciting combustion in the marketplace of ideas in this country of which Aziz was a great exponent seems to have atrophied and has degenerated. Compared to those halcyon days of knowledge brokering, information sharing, and rigorous debate with Aziz in government, we are rather left with a foreign policy discourse that for the most part, for the most part, is rather dull, it's perfunctory, and rather prosaic, in my humble view. And this is very concerning, you know, given the nature of our deeply polarized society and troubled world, matters which Aziz really agonized about. He really agonized about these issues. And this seems to be an interregnum that recalls the lines from William Butler Yeats in the second coming, where the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack, lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. So given the critical juncture that this country finds itself in global politics, let me end, let me end and as we are left with the silences of our thoughts and the rich memories of Aziz so soon after the passing of his brother, Esop, who was another dear friend with his family, uh, I want to end with an injunction of how I think Aziz brought intrinsic meaning, substance, and purpose to his craft as an intelligent thinker and a creative practitioner in the arts of diplomacy and foreign affairs by quoting from the doyen of realism, Hans Morgenthau, who wrote the following in his 1951 magisterial book in defense of the national interest. And I quote, remember that diplomacy without power is feeble and power without diplomacy is destructive and blind. Remember that no nation's power is without limits, and hence its policies must respect the power and interests of others." Unquote. For me, that is Aziz Bahad's legacy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Goss Lepe. I, I would actually not try to imagine the debate between Aziz and Esop right now as they listen to um, this uh, 
um, tribute by you to Aziz because it makes one think back of some of the debates that took place in various forum, including the Concerned African Forum, CAF. Um, at this point, I would like us to listen to a video by Ambassador Muhammad Dango. Uh, let me apologize <coughs> for not attending physically the memorial for my very, very good friend and comrade at his behalf. I wish to make a few remarks regarding Aziz's life, particularly at this point in time. <clears throat> and I want to concentrate on the areas that we went to as the uh, special envoys to the Middle East. It was a team led by the late former minister Zola Skawiya, Aziz and myself. Of course, Aziz was one of the architects of our foreign policy, particularly the foreign policy regarding the non-aligned movement, the policy of seeking peaceful solutions to uh, most conflicts, and uh, not seeking victors or vanquished. We had met with every king, foreign minister, president, from Casablanca to Baghdad, and explained and told them and uh, exposed and engaged them upon South Africa's process towards negotiations, which was seen as intractable at that particular point in time, and no solution. However, a solution was found because there were willing people to find a solution. When we got to Israel, we met the Director General, the only uh, official that we did meet, for 20 minutes. Uh, and the only message he had for us is, how does it justify and how, how can we support the expansion of settlements? Of course that was not on. We're coming to explain to them the reality of finding peaceful solutions to problems. And Aziz, at that particular moment, decided to quote former President Kennedy after the, uh, the uh, Cuban crisis, where he spoke about finding peace with the Soviet Union. And his words were, they have children, we have children. They are concerned about their children, we are concerned about our children, that a peaceful solution needs to be found um, to all of their things, including this armament and the doing away with nuclear weapons. Uh, he quoted this to the Director General of uh, the Israeli uh, Foreign Ministry, and of course I think it went over his head. He was really not interested in the question of peace but rather in the question of how they could expand and how they could be seen as the victors and the strong people and the other side could be seen as the vanquished. The message to the rest of the world from Aziz at that particular point in time, and that message is actually very, very important today, is that let us not look at victors and let us not look at vanquished. Let us look for solutions, whether it be in the Middle East, whether it be in Ukraine, whether it be in the DRC, whether it be in the South China Seas, or elsewhere in Africa, where there's intractable problems and solutions that need to be found. That would be a memorial to Aziz if we can achieve that uh, at this particular point in time. I also worked with him in other areas. I worked with him in the war in Lebanon. I worked with him in the intractable problems with Syria. I worked with him in the crises and he advised me, although he was not Deputy Foreign Minister any longer, on how to deal with the issues in Libya. And in Libya, 
of course, if we go back, it has got to do with solidarity and the wrong kind of solidarity. Solidarity on the basis of clan, solidarity on the basis of language, solidarity on the basis of family, and solidarity to achieve financial gain for a particular region. We need to do away with that kind of solidarity and find the solidarity of humanity, find the solidarity of serving people, and that is what the message that Aziz had lived and lived with me. Amantla! Viva NC Viva! Viva! They say when uh, an old man passes on or dies, it's like a library is being burned. But be that as it may, comrades and friends, memory has got an obligation to remember, to remember people like Comrade Aziz, but not only in words, but also in deeds. On that note, I would like to call upon the South African Communist Party Deputy National Chairperson, Comrade Tulas Nguyes. Viva South African Communist Party, viva! Amansa! Amansa! Viva ANC, viva! Viva SACP, viva! Viva Kosatu, viva! Panting the corruption, Panty! Panting the Shoshesake, Panty! Forward with discipline, forward! Thank you, program directors, the family and friends of Comrade Pahad, former President Mbeki and Sis Zanele, the second DSG of the African National Congress, uh, the leadership of the whole alliance, and especially the stalwarts of our movement who are gathered here, uh, ladies and gentlemen and comrades, on behalf of the South African Communist Party, our sincere condolences to the family and friends of our dearly departed friend and comrade. I realize that nothing we say can take away from the pain that death brings in its wake. But we can offer the perspective that a life well lived is never a waste. As such, maybe we must say at such times, I find comfort in the words of the German writer, an activist and a poet, Bertolt Brecht, who wrote as follows, and I quote, don't fear death so much, but rather fear the inadequate life, unquote. There was nothing inadequate about the life of our dearly departed comrade Pahad. And the American civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. puts it differently when he said, if a man hasn't discovered something that he will die for, he isn't fit to live. Oh, as an American author and a friend, of Fidel Castro, Comrade Ronnie, Ernest Hemingway's wrote, and I quote, every man's life ends the same way. It's only the details of how he lived and how he died that distinguishes one man from another. The details of Comrade Pahad's life were exemplary. As many others will say more eloquently, and they've already said it, his life was synonymous with the South African struggle for freedom and democracy. Comrade Aziz spent his life in the service of the Alliance, the ANC and the SACP, and in exile, 
who was appointed in the ANC Revolutionary Council whilst building the widest international unity and solidarity against apartheid. And of course, as Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, he usually contributed to the direction and the values underpinning the country's foreign policy, where he consistently advocated for international peace, security, justice, and human rights. He chose, and we have heard from two speakers, he chose the path of dialogue, where the alternative can only be conflict and strife, an approach that is as necessary today as ever before. And definitely will be greatly missed for that. But he left us with a challenge, a challenge to build the country. And the question for each and every one of us here is what is your role? What is my role? Don't hide behind the organization and all the rhetoric. What is my role as an individual? Am I contributing to building or am I contributing to destroying the legacy of Comrade Aziz? May his soul rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Tulas, for such profound words from the party. I think we will all agree that Comrade Aziz belongs to a generation that truly reminds us about the centrality of a principle that in an organization like the ANC, in the liberation movement like ours, a principle is not just a set of rules, but it is also the fundamental truth of the ANC. When we say we are non-racial, the second Deputy Secretary General of the ANC, Comrade Marubini Ramhopa. Amanda! Viva ANC, viva! Long live the spirit of Comrade Aziz Pahad, long live! Long live the spirit of Comrade Pahad. Long live. Long live. Viva, 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 ANC, viva. viva. Long live the Alliance. Long live. Long live. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Let me take this opportunity, of course, to acknowledge former President Tabombeki and Mayor Mazanelembeki. I'd also like to acknowledge, of course, the family of uh, Comrade Aziz Pahad and the friends, of course, that are here today. Let me take this opportunity, of course, as well, to acknowledge the friends, the comrades, and the colleagues that have worked with Comrade Pahad when he was still alive and um, younger, and, of course, all the things that he did for this particular country. Let me also acknowledge, of course, NEC members of the ANC, and the members uh, of uh, the Alliance as well. Today we are gathered uh, to pay tribute and celebrate the life and contribution of Comrade Aziz Pahad, a dedicated servant of our glorious movement, the African National Congress, and the Democratic Government, of course. His life over 82 years depicts a story of a great service, commitment to justice, and enduring love for his people. We have, of course, heard what everybody has said about him. We cannot doubt the love that he had for his people. Where does one begin to summarize an illustrious life like the one Comrade Pahad lived? It's in the legacy of his contribution to the development of our organization and the nation that we begin to develop a true appreciation for his struggle and service. 
It is through the sacrifice and commitment of leaders such as Comrade Pahad and the many who have walked before us that we are able to tell a different story of our nation. A story of great resilience and a never, an unwavering commitment to building a South Africa that serves all its people. The South African story cannot be told outside of the context of the struggle for liberation, equality, justice, and humanity. Equally, sacrifice and service are a permanent feature of the South African story. It is through the life of a great servant such as Comrade Aziz Pahad that we grow a deeper appreciation for the need to recommit ourselves to the ideals of the National Democratic Revolution with ourselves and the ANC, of course, at the helm of its advancement. We cannot envision a better South Africa for all without a deeper acknowledgement of our collective commitment and roles in building this reality. It is through the life of Comrade Pahad that we recognize the greatest responsibility we have to the development of our nation and in making sure that we shape the South Africa that we all want to live in and of course Africa that we want to live in. The ANC continues to provide a vehicle to society for such a contribution to be made. Comrade Pahar's offering to the 1912 movement have found and continue to find expression under our democratic dispensation. The evolution of our democracy over almost 30 years is a result of selfless service and the struggle our leaders have endured to the betterment of our people. As we reflect and celebrate the life of our comrade, we are reminded that indeed no victory is ever easy. It requires time, commitment, and consistency to a vision bigger than our current realities. We are encouraged that under the ANC-led government, we have remained consistent in our quest to build a non-racial, non-sexist, and democratic South Africa for all. The launch of the, nine, of the 2022 national census demonstrates that whilst we have been on the peripheries making noise, it is the ANC government, as led by the people, which has delivered on its word and building a better South Africa for all. The census tells us, of course, the story of good work done, of course, by people like Comrade Pahad in the ANC government. And um, this, of course, it uh, spoke about the work that done from 1994 to 2008. And this includes amongst the most um, households residing in formal dwellings increased from 65% in 2011 to 88,5%. 88, um, 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 and uh, those with access to electricity increased from 58% uh, in 1996 to 94% in 2022. We have made significant strides in shifting the needle from a divided and broken South Africa we inherited in 1994 to a more united country where diversity is not the basis of exclusion and weakness, but rather the basis of inclusion and strength. Therefore, we want to thank the Pahad family for being generous with their father, their son, and their brother. We want to assure you that his contributions to the evolution of the country's democracy are evident in our present realities. Fellow comrades, ladies and gentlemen, we locate the genesis of Comrade Aziz's life in the small town of the then Transvaal, but his destiny was to shape the South Africa that we live in as a nation. Born, of course, as we all know, on the 7th of May, 1940, Comrade Pahar's early years were shaped by the injustices and inequalities that characterized South Africa during that tumultuous period. His response to the call for justice was not one of the pervasive uh, resignation, but an active resistance. He joined the struggle at an early age, becoming involved in Transvaal Indian Congress and the African National Congress. He faced harassment, arrest, and burning by the security forces, but he never gave up his commitment to this freedom that you are enjoying here today. In the face of escalating apartheid brutality, Comrade Aziz made the courageous decision to go into exile, joining the ranks of countless other anti-apartheid activists. This decision, born out of deep commitment to the principle of equality and justice, marked the beginning of his formidable contribution to the liberation of South Africa and our people. He was a son 
of activists, but he became a leader of a movement. He was a student of sociology and Africans, but he mastered the art of diplomacy, as we all know. During uh, his years in exile, Comrade Aziz Pahad engaged in diplomatic efforts to garner international support for the anti-apartheid cause. His tireless advocacy on the global stage played a crucial role in raising awareness about the atrocities occurring in South Africa in those years. His diplomacy was not only about condemning injustice, but also about forging alliance that would later prove instrumental in the downfall of apartheid. Upon the dismantling of apartheid and the dawn of democracy in South Africa, Comrade Aziz Pahad returned to his homeland to contribute to the nation's reconstruction and development. His dedication did not go unnoticed. After the 1994 general election, he was appointed Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, a position he held with distinction from 1994 to 2008. As Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Comrade Aziz Pahad continued his diplomatic efforts, now focused on building a better Africa and a better world. He played a crucial role in reshaping the country's foreign policy, emphasizing human rights, justice, and economic uh, development. I'm just saying that, of course, he was disappointed with the current policy that we have. Have, but we hope that we will learn more and be able to improve what would represent what he stood for. Comrade Aziz Pahad leadership contributed to South Africa's emergence as a respected and influential voice on the African continent and the global stage. He was widely respected as a skillful mediator and facilitator who helped resolve conflicts in crisis of Africa and beyond, and the Middle East, of course, as we had Ambassador Dango um, 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 talking about their lives together. As we reflect upon his life and legacy, we honor a man whose journey was marked by a profound and selfless dedication to the cause of freedom and equality. Comrade Aziz Pahad was not merely a witness to history. He was an active participant in the struggle against the oppressive apartheid regime and gave his whole life to the noble cause, the liberation of mankind. Beyond the corridors of power and international diplomacy, Comrade Aziz's legacy endures in the hearts of those who remember him not just as a statesman, but a compassionate human being and principled comrade. As we bid farewell to Comrade Aziz, we do it with gratitude for his invaluable contribution to the struggle against apartheid and the subsequent construction of a more just and and inclusive South Africa. His legacy lives on and enduring inspiration for all who continue to strive for a world where justice, equality, and human dignity prevails. With those little ways, I would like to just say, Robalaka Khoso, Comrade Aziz, and condolences to the family. Amanda! Amanda! Thank you, Comrade Deputy Secretary General, for those words. We'll immediately go into the tributes uh, by the family, and I'll call on Comrade Amina Pahat, who's named after her grandmother, uh, the great uh, Amina Pahat, and there's many stories to be told about, uh, um, so over to you, Amina. Amina's also the daughter of Isop Pahat. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Hi. President Mbeki, Mamzanele, Auntie Anjana, family, friends, comrades, all protocol observed. Ever since I was born, ever since, <laughs> thanks, 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 ever since I was born, Uncle Aziz and my dad came together as a pair like a two-for-one package deal. And I quickly learned that it had always been that way. They had grown up together, sharing a bedroom. They had studied together at WITS. 
They had played football together at Dynamos, joined the Transvaal Indian Youth Congress together, been banned together, been exiled together, lived in the UK together, got married together in a double wedding in 1971, and the list goes on. Luckily for me, my brother and my mum, they didn't get divorced together. <laughs> but that seemed to be one of the few blips in their otherwise parallel lives. But those two Pahad brothers, while having a lot in common, had very different personalities. I found Uncle Aziz to be more playful, and he had a very naughty streak. I grew up listening to stories being regaled with much humor about the drama that would inevitably ensue from Uncle Aziz's womanizing. My older sister, Yasmin, who used to live with them in North End House, was under strict instructions from Uncle Aziz that if any woman called, she was to say he's not in. <laughs> but when he was cornered, for example, the time he mistakenly invited two different girlfriends to the same house party, he somehow managed to get out alive and without creating any enemies. And this was one of his superpowers. It was very, very hard to stay angry with Uncle Aziz. He was loved and respected so widely. And apart from being charming, I think this was because he really cared about understanding where people came from. He asked for people's opinions, no matter how important or unimportant they were, no matter how well-schooled they were in politics or not, no matter their age. And he was genuinely interested in what they had to say. And when you're partaking in a battle of the minds, understanding how people think and why they think that way is absolutely critical. This, in addition to his immense intellect, allowed him to understand the most complex of situations and win over the toughest of adversaries. However, he was always also able to hide his intellect when it suited him. My parents often joked about the way he could bumble around aimlessly in a group of people involved in small talk or serious discussions, giving the impression that everything was just wafting past him. But if the opinions expressed were discussed the next day, Uncle Aziz would remember every single word that was said, like a master detective. One thing he was a little bit less amiable about, or less understanding of, was people that didn't drink. <laughs> Uncle Aziz would often intercept me and my friends, some of them are here today, as we were heading out for the evening. The lounge was right by the front door. And he then says, come, sit down. Let's talk politics, talk Palestine, have a drink. And God forbid if anyone said they didn't want to drink. It seemed to upset him even more that the fact that us youth were not mobilizing, and that upset him a lot. He would give us these puzzled looks, followed by a full-on Spanish inquisition. And then finally, we were told, futzak in the kindest way possible, of course. And then as we, that's his son, Sam, and, and his nieces and nephews, as we all got older and had kids, he started enjoying all the grandchildren more and more. Um, he didn't expect them to drink. Um, but we would celebrate his birthday and Christmas jointly every year. He was born on Christmas Day. And which might have been, we realized later, quite confusing for the children. You know, none of us being religious, we never explained Christmas to the kids. And last year, my nephew, um, at his nursery school, the teacher asked them if anyone knows who was born on Christmas Day. <laughs> so my nephew, rightly so, said, my Uncle Aziz, you know? <laughs> So when the teacher asked, OK, fine, and do you know who Jesus Christ is? So he said, yeah, that's the guy Papa swears at when people drive badly. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't go down too well. Um, but clearly, Uncle Aziz will always remain a legend of biblical proportions in the eyes of his grandchildren. So as Aziz got a little older and wiser, he mellowed somewhat. 
or one could say he grew up, which allowed him to find the love of his life, Anjana, 20 years ago. The incomparably brilliant Anjana, as Sam described her at Aziza's funeral, which is absolutely true. Her light-hearted humor, never taking anything too seriously, coupled with her serious, uh, sharp intellect, made her the perfect match for my uncle. She's been a gift, not only to Uncle Aziz, but to the whole Pahad family. Thank you, Anjukaki, for looking after, <laughs> it still sounds funny, <laughs> for looking after Aziz in an absolutely superhuman manner when he was sick, and for standing by us so solidly when Dad was unwell. We're eternally grateful to you, and we love you. So, while the Pahad family is struggling to move past <clears throat> the void left by losing three Pahad brothers in the space of only a few months, all of them giants leaving this planet in a better form than they found it. We take huge comfort in knowing that Aziz and Aesop are lying next to each other, literally. And um, just like they did in this life, they're ready to set off on the next part of their journey together. And no doubt any passers-by on this journey, are sure to hear them shouting at each other, Ufunawena, with Uncle Aziz responding, Futsak! <laughs> They'd better be ready for them wherever they end up, because they've got some surprise coming their way. Rest in peace, our kind, loving, humble, huge-hearted, magnificently witty, and ever-entertaining Uncle Aziz. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, that was quite uh, informative and quite uh, touching. And you actually reminded me of one general in Athens, Pericles, after a war when he had to, at a moment like this, when he was paying a tribute to the soldiers. And then he says, I quote, the sacrifice which they collectively made was individually repaid to them, for they received again each one for himself a praise which grows not old and noblest of all tombs. I speak of that in which their glory survives and is proclaimed always and on every fitting occasion, both in word and in deed." Close quote. On that note, comrades, I would like to call the brother-in-law to Mam Angela, Dr. Adam Mohammed, to make a tribute. We will give him a round of applause. Thank you, program director. To comrades, friends, family, Your Excellency, President Thabo Mbeki, and Mama Zanele Mbeki, all protocols observed. On behalf of Anjana and the Parek family, I wish to thank the ANC for organizing the memorial for Aziz. Those who travel from far and wide, thank you. Aziz, your life was a blessing. 
and your memory will be cherished. We are deeply saddened by your loss, but grateful for the time we had together. Our beloved, our beloved brother, you have left us far too soon, but your loving presence will forever endure in our hearts and souls. Your life was one of selflessness, dedication to the cause, and love for your fellow man. Aziz was born on 25th of December, 1940, on Christmas Day, a spiritual day in the Christmas calendar, and passed away on the 27th of September, a holy day for the Muslim community. It was the birth of Prophet, uh, of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. On both these days, it is said that the doors of heaven are open. And so, Aziz had a free pass. <laughs> Ironically, for a man who did not believe in any organized religion, he would be blessed with not one, but two significant days. But then, Aziz was an unusual man. Aziz, as we know, was born at the height of World War II. His own life taking a war of its own. He fought against the apartheid regime. Post-1994, he assumed the role of Deputy Foreign Minister, fighting to prevent war, example in Libya, in Iraq, in the Middle East. I have known Aziz for 20 years. Throughout our friendship, I came to know Aziz not only as a gentleman, but one with humility, humbleness, gentleness, and integrity, a man for whom money and material possessions meant very little. On his visits to Durban, on one such visit, I'd invited about three to four couples to come and have dinner with us at home. But by end's day, the jungle drums beat so loud that the telephone calls to me came fast and furious, all wanting the opportunity to meet with Aziz. By the end of the night, we had at least 40 to 50 friends at home. Fortunately, Jabu, my right hand, managed to rustle up a, managed to rustle up a meal that would feed an army, let alone 40 or 50 people. Every visit that Aziz made to Aziz and Anjana made in the early days, they stayed with us. And Jabu would be excited, as she would now have the opportunity to have breakfast and mid-morning tea with the minister. And both of them looked forward to the break. I say this because Aziz had no airs and graces about him. Aziz would be sitting with a gardener or a billionaire. He'd get the, they'd get the same treatment. Aziz, being a true diplomat, excelled at listening without interrupting and took, took to heart the commands made. Everybody gravitated towards Aziz and felt that they had a special bond with him, which was an Aziz quality. We would often visit Anjana, especially in the latter days, recently, at their home. And as often happened, 
an evening drink or two for Aziz was on the cards. After the first drink, Anjana would attempt to doctor his second drink by diluting it. But Aziz being Aziz would realize very early on in the evening that his drink was not what he had ordered and would put up his hands and he says, my brother, look at this woman really. She's giving me Coca-Cola. <laughs> as sick as Aziz was, he could not be duped. In his latter days, when he was very ill and confined to bed, he would ask me, so Adam, where are we going today? And what are our plans? And I would tell him, I said, my brother, to a lovely restaurant of your choice, depending on your boss, Anjana, approving of it. And he'd throw his hands up and say, but my brother, he says, in this house, I have the veto power. <laughs> I was sitting in Aziz's room about 10 years ago. Isu was around as well. And so my nephew found me and he said, I have the car you're looking for. I said, great. Black in color, two door. I said, wonderful. But he says, the problem is, he's got a hard top. So I said, no. Too old for that. So after I drop the phone, Aziz tells me, he says, why are you refusing the car? I said, no, I couldn't take that car really. You know, he says, no, take it. I says, tell me why. He says, well, I'm coming to Durban very soon. You and me will drive around the beachfront with the open hood and we'll wave to all the women. So Anjana, as usual, destroyer of our dreams, <laughs> would say, hey, no woman is going to look at you two old guys. They would be waving at the car. <laughs> there is so much more that I could regale to you, time permitting. It does not. So I'd like to end my reflections on Aziz by quoting Khalil Gibran on giving. You give little, you give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. This sums up a Jesus life. Farewell, my friend. Hamagashte. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Adam and Amina, for bringing Aziz and Esop into the room. Amongst everybody sitting here tonight, there are many friends. They are comrades, they are those who worked with him at the Tabumbeki Foundation and in many other of the roles that he was involved in. And I think we definitely can relate to the stories told. And, and yes, uh, we'll miss him. But he did need that free pass, hence the uh, days that he was born and he passed on. There was one family member who said to me when he was very ill earlier in the year, it seems as though there's a contestation about who takes Aziz, um, because they're not sure whether he's going to go the Christian route or the other route. Well, he sorted that out himself, you know, by the look of things. Angela, it's your turn. 
and I'm not going to spoil the introduction Amina gave. I think I can't compete with that. So I'll just welcome you to give that ode to Aziz. And you once said he gave you, what, a 20-year trial run? <laughs> we can talk about many things and times together, about the laughter, the moments that were somber, the tears and all. But Aziz was Aziz. Thank you, Comrade. Thank you very much, and to the program directors. I want to say, acknowledge President Becky and Sister Zanella, but I want to also acknowledge them as family today. They've always been family to me and to Aziz. And thank you very much for being here with us today and honoring his life. To all the comrades that are here today, to the ANC, the Alliance partners, and to friends and family, thank you very much for being with us this evening. I've titled my address, and I hope I am composed enough to read it all, but it's my ode to Aziz. My dearest Aziz, it has been two weeks since you left us and in this time, I've had the chance to reflect on our years together. And I would like to take this opportunity to share some final thoughts with you. We met over 20 years ago, having been introduced by our mutual friend, Comrade Mo Sheikh, at a party held by the then Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, Ambassador Zobedi. I recall late that evening giving you a ride home, and never forgot how awkwardly shy you were, much to my amusement. From that day on, our life has never been the same. In 2011, we decided to marry, and you often told the story that you were under the impression that we were hosting a party, only to realize that somewhere in the planning, the party turned to a wedding. And what a fun, memorable wedding it was. Aziz, you'd be pleased to know that many of the guests that were at the wedding are here this evening, though I would say to you that I don't think that they can put on dancing shoes anymore. <laughs> My surprise wedding gift to you was a house full of nieces, nephews, cats, at one time a dog, and a host of in-laws. And to your credit, you embraced them all. Though from time to time, the diplomat in you would remind them of a two-state solution, each with its own territory. <laughs> I have learned so much about you in our years together, and similarly, you held a mirror for me to learn about myself. Here are some of the observations that stand out. You are absolutely devoid of ego. You were always the same person, whether on a global stage or in the family kitchen. With you, what you see is what you get. You had zero interest in material things and were your happiest shopping in a flea market looking for bargains. You never hesitated to hand over your valued possessions to others in need, in part because you had no clue as to its value. You were loved. I suppose your humility is one of the many characteristics that drew people to you, along with your razor-sharp wit. I honestly do not know of a person that did not like you. On the contrary, a home was a hub of activity with you attracting a wide range of friends, family, comrades, who simply relished being in your presence. Often I sat in silent awe, witnessing the depth integrity, and intellectual complexity in the nature of the discussions held. No discussion was unimportant to you, and by Jove, 
did I witness many over our years of marriage. I always marveled at the joy you took from human interaction. Your love for people, irrespective of status, shone brightly for all to see. We were all attracted to your light. This remarkable ability of yours to find and build enduring and authentic relationships across race, gender, and all other divides was your gift and one of the many qualities that made you so special. People who knew you simply could not get enough of your presence. And whilst you would shy away from this assertion, you must know that your funeral was a tribute to your popularity, character, and the impact you've had on our country and this world. Your beloved friends, Tabun Zanele Mabeki, remained at your side from your university days with Sister Nella Edwards to throughout your years in exile. They sat next to you during your illness, night and day, and mourned with me and the nation your loss. On your behalf and mine, I want to thank everyone who made your funeral so special and dignified and amicably accommodated different perspectives and traditions. And I'm sure you would agree with me in thanking today the ANC for hosting this event. And our special thanks goes to Comrade Phoebe and her team for the sterling work and the support they've provided to us over the last week to two. To continue, your achievements were all the more remarkable given your disdain for planning and organizing. Your love-hate relationship with technology always made me laugh. I'll never forget how you spent two hours recounting your life story to a dictaphone that happened to be off. <laughs> Remarkably, your book was published and a huge success. You didn't know how to drive, despite your repeated threats to the contrary, yet always got to where you needed to be. And your popularity was all the more impressive given your re limited recall of people's names. On the other hand, Aziz, you are undoubtedly the most creative problem solver I have ever met. I recall a time when we saw Dr. Asfat, who was the ANC renowned dietitian. And after Dr. Asfat telling us what we could and couldn't eat, and mainly staying off carbohydrates, you remained silent through it all. And at the very end, Dr. Asfat asked, are there any questions? And you broke your silence and said, yes, I have. And he asked, what's the question? And you said, well, how many glasses of wine can I have? <laughs> And Dr. Aswath said, well, how many would you like to have? And so Aziz said, two glasses. And so Dr. Aswath said, well, in that case, you may have one glass of wine. Well, needless to say, all the way back to Pretoria, Aziz complained bitterly about why he had said two and not three glasses of wine. <laughs> not to be deterred, the story gets better. Not to be deterred, he returned home the next day with the biggest wine glass I had ever seen. <laughs> Emphatically stating that the doctor had only limited the number of glasses, not the size. <laughs> Aziz had an, un you had an unquenchable, I'm, I'm talking to Aziz, you had an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Your curiosity of human relations and the human condition was endless. You were always obsessed, correctly so, with all that was going on in the country, in Africa, and in the world. Often, I would find you in the early hours of the morning, fast asleep, with the newspapers, magazine, and books scattered around you, with the television still on. I love this about you, and I learned so much from you. But your thirst for knowledge extended to many dimensions, including the mundane. He loved updates from about the neighbors from our dear helper Lizzie, who excelled in her role as the Abbotswell Road town crier. <laughs> he wanted news about what's happening down the hospital passage from his nurses. 
and he particularly relished updates from our nieces and nephews, and I always suspected that was to relive his youth vicariously through them. Aziz, you were passionate about peace, justice, and fairness. As kind and gentle as you were, you demonstrated a will of steel when it comes to your conviction, when it came to your convictions. From your childhood right up until the very end, you pursued a fair, just, and peaceful world. As all of us who are gathered here know, you were a loyal, committed, and disciplined member of the NC from, the youth, from your youth to your last breath. As you have always said, the ANC is part of my DNA. You lived your life in accordance with this tourism, and despite all that may have happened, either by friend or foe, you never wavered from your stoic belief in the virtues of the ANC. Accordingly, the honor bestowed upon you by the ANC today is indeed fitting. Your words will forever echo in my mind the world is sleepwalking its way into global conflict without realizing there can be no victors. Your foresight of recent events in the Middle East was prescient. You and many comrades who departed before you, and I think here of Comrade George Nene, Esop, Comrade Jojo, Comrade Billy Modise, Ismail Convardia, to name a few, you spent many nights solving the world's problems from our living room, endlessly debating ANC renewal and pondering the question, what is to be done? Now that you are all reunited, I trust the discussion has resumed. I humbly request, Aziz, that you solve the problem before the day that I join you. You were resilient, optimistic and determined. Your innate optimism, your enduring resilience, gave me and others a sense of comfort and security in a troubled world. In this, you were our lodestar. You defied death on countless occasions. In fact, even our cat, Brussel, clung to you, hoping to add to his nine lives. Despite the hardship of the present past few months, I never once heard a hint of self-pity only plans for future holidays and more of the sharp wit, not to mention your cute powers of observation. And as Adam said, there was never a chance that I could ever dilute your wine. Isop always remarked, if you want Aziz to leave a party, you need to start telling him at least 45 minutes before the time. It's only fitting Aziz that your final exit followed Aesop's. True to form, you made a point by making him wait, though you did manage to stretch it to 11 weeks this time. I suspect, though, you got a mouthful from Aesop, and in true brotherly fashion, you simply ignored him. Finally, you taught me what it means to love. In 2005, Aziz wrote me a letter at 2.30 in the morning from your hospital bed. It is now time for me to say back to you some of the words you had written to me that night, and I quote, I'm searching for words to express my deepest appreciation for your love, affection, compassion, and concern. Since meeting you, my whole life has been transformed. You have enriched and given new context to my concepts of friendship, comradeship, anti-materialism, and love. My only regret is that we did not meet earlier. You enriched my life more than I have ever expected." End quote. Well, Aziz, all I can say is that you've given me the happiest years of my life. My final words to you will be those of the poet Pablo Neruda. I love you without knowing how or when, or from where. I love you straightforwardly, without complexities or pride. So I love you because I know no other way. Thank you.
I don't think this looks <laughs>
and the, the Bishop Manu Simpunwana, the, who was the chairperson of the Interfaith Forum, General Secretary of South African Council of Churches. Uh, He said, uh, as they met, that as we gather here, let us remember that the power for change resides within us, and together we shall harness our collective wisdom and passion to chart a transformative path for our beloved country. And so the two themes of the convention were our country, our responsibility. That was one of them. The other was from awareness to action. They invited me, the interfaith leaders, they invited me to attend the conference as an observer, the convention. And I was rather pleased that I got the invitation because I thought it would give me a chance to listen to people that I don't normally listen to. Because these were people in the, uh, organized by the Interfaith uh, Forum and therefore drawn from all of the various uh, faiths in our country. The Christians and the Judaic people and the Muslims and the Hindus and the Baha'i and, and everybody, the independent African churches. That whole cross-section of people who gathered here, including a lot of the community-based organizations. I'm saying I was very glad I was there because normally it's not the section echelon of our country that normally one has the privilege to listen to, to hear their views and, and understand their passions and their feelings. Yeah. And they spoke out. I attended the meeting on Monday. I couldn't attend the meeting the following day. Tuesday. I attended the third day also. And essentially what they were saying, these people, these representatives from all over the country, from all of these different faiths, from all of sorts of sections of civil society, that the country is in crisis. They were saying wherever you look, you see a crisis. Numbers of people who are unemployed continue to increase. People who are poor continue to increase. He talked about a woman who killed her three children and herself because they had no food. And spoke across the board and said they, they fear to get out of their houses at night because of the levels of crime. and they don't trust government. I listened to one of the delegates there who spoke out very passionately and said, uh, we must be very honest in what we want to say because of the problems that we face. And talked about something I was not sensitive to, the, level of, the levels of mental health, ill health, mental ill health among young people. And they were saying so much so that uh, the degree of the incidence of suicide among young people is frightening. That the, there's something about the absence of, the, of wellness in our society which is destroying, destroying all of us as human beings. And I was saying that this particular delegate says, and when we say all of these things and we say these things need a solution, we have to be frank. We have to say for 30 years the ANC has been our government here. And all of these things that are happening, negative things, is because of them. So I, I sat there listening to all this and, uh, and really felt rather sad. Uh, 
I was, re I was re I remembered for some reason that we were going to have this meeting. Because they were saying the ANC has betrayed us. The ANC has betrayed our hopes. Um, enough is enough. I'm saying I felt rather sad because somehow I remember I thought about this meeting and thought here is a, we are going to say farewell to, to Aziz who never betrayed anybody. Very ANC to, to the bone. But I, Aziz would have taken that uh, accusation to heart. He would have said it's part of his, part of what he did wrongly, which contrib contributed to that conclusion which was communicated by those people. They were saying the answers betrayed them. Uh, enough is enough. Aziz, uh, was a professional revolutionary for many of his years. And by that I mean somebody who was dedicated 24 hours of the day to ensuring the success of these revolutionary objectives, which had to do with a better life for our people, which had to do with the liberation of our people from apartheid oppression. And therefore, the things in which he engaged uh, very concentrated on this matter, how do we make change on the lives of our people for the better? I was very, very sorry that uh, the recorded message by Professor Vili Estereze was cut short. I don't know why. Uh, because indeed, it would have been very good to listen, as, uh, as Garth was saying, it would have been very good to listen to the rest of what Professor Esther said. Because as, 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 as Vili was saying, that they started engaging with Aziz and others, Tony True, in England, I joined them later, this group of Africaners, a delegation led by Aziz, to engage. Vili talked there about uh, one of the high points of that engagement when he, when he was given a message by the apartheid regime that he could tell us that the regime was now ready to meet with the ANC and made the arrangements so that we met them. We were prepared for that. And the reason we were prepared for it was because during the course of those discussions, one of these Africaners gave us a report they used to tell us what was happening at home and all that. And he said that there had been a meeting of the cabinet and the, and the Minister of Finance had said apartheid was no longer affordable. At the end of that meeting, as we normally would do when they had left, we would meet. And as he said, but President, uh, the community, how did you hear this? They say that a report was given to cabinet to say apart apartheid is no longer affordable. And then we decided that, well, in which case, the logical consequence of that is that they will then say, let us negotiate. So indeed, when Vili came and said, indeed, this, they say, let's negotiate, we were not surprised. But I'm talking about that Aziz involved in this work as a professional revolutionary. He starts to make sure that we did everything possible to bring, to bring closer the day when the people will be liberated from oppression. I can talk of many, many other things that Aziz did. In the negotiations with the government delegation, one of the things we agreed was that uh, they should, we agreed on the release of political prisoners and banning of organizations, all these things, that they should uh, indicate to us well ahead of time when Madiba would be released. 
after we'd agreed it was going to be released, the day on which it would be released. <coughs> Fine, and then they would send a message to me so that we would prepare for it properly. So uh, then I had to go to England at that particular point for another meeting with Villiers Therese and the others. Uh, what had happened was that we had agreed on uh, some phrase, some sentence that would come from this African Nigeria at home from government to indicate when Madiba would be released uh, in the day. So I told Zanele that as I was leaving for London, that they will call and may very well say the following. If they do, please pass on the message to Aziz in London. Who would give it to me, sure. So indeed, one day, as we're in London, uh, a very, very good uh, person who stayed with Aziz at the time, and Davis, unfortunately, very late, late now, she sends Aziz a message and passes on this message. So Aziz tells me that Anna sent a phone to say the following. So I said, we get well, thanks, thanks, Aziz. It took me a day, a full day, to remember that was the code for the release of Nelson Mandela. Zanella so kept the message for a few days because it was nonsensical. The rains will ne rain on Thursday. So, so what? <laughs> and so when we get to Anne in London, she treated it in the same way. So, so, so what? So it gets to me, also I didn't quite understand until a day later. It was in fact, I, I realized what it meant the day before my diva was released. So we panicked and now because we had to, wanted to write the, state, this, the statement, what would my diva going to say? But it was too late. In that instance, Aziz couldn't help. Couldn't help, we were very late. And my diva did make the statement that it did. We were not too happy with parts of it. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but I'm talking here about uh, Comrade who was a professional revolutionary. And when we come to government and uh, when, uh, what was said about the work that he was doing uh, uh, in foreign affairs, very correct, and the engagements we had. We had uh, uh, in 2002, I think it was, we even had a meeting with uh, at the Spear Farm in the Eastern Cape, wine farm. Uh, you remember that? Uh, Trevor might remember that. When Aziz had organized that there would be representatives of the Israeli community and representatives of the Palestinians who would come together and we would sit them, we sat with them. Uh, at the Spear Farm, I think it was 2002, to discuss the resolution of this problem. Uh, and brought in all sorts of elements, where there were military matters that had to be brought, brought in, we brought in the National Defense Force. Intelligence people came in to try and say to them, fundamental to this thing is the right of the Palestinian people. This must be addressed at all of the Palestinian state and all of that. Otherwise, there is no solution. <coughs> and such problems as uh, <coughs> the Jewish people might have had, let's address them. In the end, it didn't work. But it was a signal of Aziz's in, 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 in very serious intent that the problem of this kind must be solved and that we had a role to play in it. This is a professional revolutionary who, was, who lived up to his task. But as I say, of the liberation of our people. But yesterday and on Monday, the, I listened to others of our people saying, uh, the ANC has betrayed us. And this is the, the circular that was 
distributed for that interfaith meeting. Let a million voices be heard. I'm mentioning this thing about Aziz also because I think it's, it's unfortunate that he's left us when he has left us. Because what this, these people organized by the Interfaith Forum said on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday was correct. They were not inventing the fact that you had a mother in the Eastern Cape who murdered her three children and killed herself because they ate, ate random food. That's a signal of something that's going very wrong. What they were saying, those people were correct. And the challenge we face, uh, those of us who are alive, is how do we respond to that reality? I think that's why, again, I felt very sorry that Aziz left us when he did because he was very, very ready to confront that truth, to confront that truth and do something about it as a professional revolutionary. One of the issues they raised, the delegates at the Interfaith Convention, was that the, they said the The government, the government was not helping them. That there was a crisis of governance uh, in the country and indeed some, something needed to be done about that. Otherwise the problems to which they were pointing out would not be solved. In the last few weeks I discovered uh, a very interesting speech by the current CEO of the Institute of Race Relations. I've quoted this speech before in other meetings, and I'm told some of my colleagues in the ANC are a bit uneasy about that because they say, why am I quoting right-wingers? And what I've understood always in the course of our struggle as a revolutionary, we need to understand everything, absolutely everything about what the right-wingers are doing what they are thinking, how they sleep, and everything. That's necessary for us to be able to win our victory. Because we're running out of time, let me I just quote one thing that this CEO of the, of the Institute of Race Relations says, Dr. John Andres. And he said, instead of political currents, a different trend will shape South Africa's outcome over the medium term. This is the receding power of the state, its loss of authority and credibility, its inability to translate plans into action, and the growing disconnect between the ruling elites and those they govern. And he said this process will play out over a period of years, but is already well underway. And I think this, this assessment is correct. The receding power of the state, its loss of authority, credibility, its inability to translate plans into action, and the growing disconnect between the ruling elites and those they govern. I think Dr. Enders is telling the truth about what is happening in this country. And again, it's something that we have to address. Because, and he says, Dr. Enders, in the end, that what this process is going to lead to in the end is that you will have capital and civil society running the country. And the democratic state will have disappeared. And for the democratic state to disappear means the overwhelming majority of our people, the poor, lose hope. Because capital and that civil society are not going to help them. 
So this problem that is raised by that interfaith forum, which is reflected again by what Andre says, the receding power of the state. Again, you had people like Ngozazana, Aziz, uh, Ayanda Nzaluma, who would want to respond to that because they have actual experience. They are the ones who set up, reconstituted the Foreign Affairs Department, later DERCO. So they were practically involved uh, uh, in the process of the construction of the democratic state. The one that Andres says correctly now is receding. And therefore we're losing that possibility for the state to act in the interest of these millions and millions of our people who are poor and disempowered. But again, as this is gone, it would have been very, very useful as a, an activist to play a role in that process of the reconstruction of the democratic state. I'm rushing somewhat uh, uh, about all of this. Because they, uh, that statement made by these people to say the ANC has betrayed them was incorrect. Uh, but there's an explanation that the ANC has to make about what has been happening in this country. And one of these things is indeed, has been, quite correctly, the, uh, the weakening of the ANC. The ANC itself has spoken about this. There's a famous, famous report uh, of 2017 of the ANC delivered by the then Secretary General. It was called a diagnostic report. Um, let me again read just one part of what that report said. It said the ANC faces declining fortunes, internal squabbles, money politics, corruption, and poor performance in government, all conspire to undermine its legitimacy in the eyes of the broader public. Some progressive formations and individuals who historically have been part of the broad forces, broad front of forces for change, are challenging the movement on important current issues, particularly corruption. And that report had said the primary mission of the ANC is to serve the people of South Africa, and the ANC exists for the people of South Africa. It is therefore the historic mission of the ANC to build a humane, and caring society. So, uh, the ANC realizing that problem, the one indicated in that diagnostic report, decided that the ANC needs to renew itself. It said that this conference in 2017 that the ANC must re renew itself for its very survival. The fact of the matter, though, is that we did not do that. We did not renew the ANC following that conference resolution of 2017. That resolution has been repeated by the conference of 2022 to renew the ANC. We're now uh, in October. That was 10 months ago that that resolution was renewed. Nothing has happened to renew the ANC. So what was diagnosed in 2017, we're not attending to. Again, I'm mentioning this, I'm mentioning this because, again, unfortunately, we've lost We've lost Aziz, 
Because again, in terms of that renewal of the ANC, I think we would want him to be there. So that becomes part of the people who define what this ANC should look like. Not it what was described, not as it was described in that diagnostic report. As this is gone, but he's left us, I think, he's left us with a task. Uh, a task in reality, in substance, to respond in full to all of these things that were said over early this week by these thousands of our people who, in, who met as the Interfaith Convention to respond to all of those things. Even one of them stood up and said, one of the things he can't understand, because he's got a child at university, why has been the distribution of the NSFAS grants has been privatized? Why have we hired uh, private companies to distribute this NSFAS bursaries? which are now charging these children to pay out of those bursaries to pay these distributors. He said he can't understand it. Well, I can't either. Um, but as we say farewell at Comet Aziz, I think all of us would want to make this commitment. But we've had our people, because indeed, as if that diagnostic report says the ANC exists to serve the people. We've had our people. And what we will try to do is to emulate the example that you set. Thank you very much, Comrade Aziz, and goodbye. Thank you. Another one, please. Thank you, President Mbeki, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Quite loaded. Like I said earlier on, this is a generation that has uh, confronted tempting and testing moments with calmness and uh, intellectual prowess. And now we know that it is also a generation that reminded us about the centrality of principles, that principles are the DNA of this organization. And one such principle is unity, which is a principle that is always abused, <coughs> echoed, without action. So President Mbegi has spoken to things that many of us we know and things that not only we should know about but that we should act on. I want to thank you for that, President Mbegi, and thank you for everybody. On that note, comrades, compatriots, we're coming towards the end of this August occasion that uh, where we made a tribute for the life and times of Utata Comrade Aziz Bahad, I'll call upon the PC member of Houghton, Comrade Dr. Bandile Masuku, to do a vote of thanks. Amanda! Away to long live the undying spirit of Comrade Aziz Bahad, long live! Amanda, all power. Thank you, program directors. On behalf of the ANC in Gauteng, I would like to express a profound sense of gratitude, first and foremost, to the family of Komet Aziz for sharing Komet Aziz with us, for affording him the opportunity to play a sterling role sometimes a daring role in, in liberation of our country, for allowing him to be part of the Sentinel Group who formed part of the first group that built the new South Africa, 
who form part of shaping and guiding our international posture and diplomacy. With that said, it is clear that what is currently transpiring in the Middle East, we are certain that he will be the one who will be saying we stand in solidarity with the people of Palestine and we condemn the Zionist behavior of the Israelist government. We further extend our gratitude to all who have made this memorial service very special and very successful and partly very informative. To the Vice Chancellor of the, United, of the University of Johannesburg, Prof. Mbedi, and the University, thanks for hosting us today and thanks for hosting this special occasion. To all the speakers who've paid tribute to Comrade Aziz, the Stalwarts, Comrade Wallis Rute, Prof. Velem Esterese, Dr. Garth, Comrade Dango, we also thank you for your kind words. We equally appreciate all the tributes from the family. You truly explained and elucidated the life and times of Comrade Aziz, especially Comrade Prof. Angena. Thank you for the warm words and special words to Comrade Aziz. And again, we'd like to thank all the messages of condolences that we have received from across the breadth and length of our country. Our special gratitude goes to President Mbeki and his wife, Mam Zanele, for gracing and being part of this occasion, but also being closer to the family and also to Kermit Aziz. Lastly, the gratitude goes to all of us who are here, ANC leaders, former leaders, SACP, COSATU, who have formed part of this occasion and, special, and made it very special and very informative. We also like to make sure that we thank the program directors, Comrade Bessani and Comrade Geraldine, for skillfully and capably managing this program. And to the organizing team led by Comrade Phoebe, we thank you. Whilst our thoughts are with the people of Palestine, let the name of Comrade Aziz live long in our hearts. I thank you. Thank you very much, comrades. I think uh, we are done. I know Mkita Upeli, Kuban Bakantu, or Umsebez Upeli, Kuban Bakan, but thank you very much. We can have a revolutionary song. There are people over there. We can start one as we do the goodbyes. <laughs>